Good afternoon and welcome to today's next webinar in our COVID conversation series, Symptom Management of COVID-19 in Senior Living Facilities. My name is Keita Scholl. I'm the Office Manager for the Coalition for Compassionate Care of California. We're glad to have you all with us today. I'd like to take a brief moment to thank our sustaining supporters. These organizations support the coalition financially every year, and we could not do the work that we do without them. I'd also like to thank our sponsors of the COVID Conversations webinar series. Thank you so much to these organizations for your support. If you haven't had a chance to check out our COVID Conversations toolbox, there are many, many resources uh, copies of the recordings from past COVID conversation webinars and everything that you need from multiple organizations to navigate your way through this difficult time. Be sure to check it out. It's now my honor to introduce our presenters today. Takeshi Uemura is a palliative care and geriatric medicine specialist in Honolulu. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Geriatric Medicine and the Division of Palliative Medicine at University of Hawaii School of Medicine. By utilizing his broad knowledge of both fields, he provides patient-centered care in various settings, including nursing homes, home-based palliative care, and inpatient palliative care units. Dr. Uemura received his fellowship training in geriatrics and palliative medicine at Icom School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. He is also a founder of Vital Talk Japan. Dr. Eric Chin serves as the clinical director of SR Care, a group of three geriatric physicians and two nurse practitioners. SR Care provides care to 900 beds in eight nursing facilities and 30 assisted living and adult family homes in Yakima County, Washington. SR Care has cared for more than 200 COVID-19 patients. Dr. Chin is involved in leading public health efforts and forming infection control policies, along with the Centers for Disease Control, Washington State Department of Health, and Yakima Health District. Dr. Eric Chin completed his geriatric fellowship with Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Welcome to our presenters. I will turn it over to you, Dr. Uemura. Um, thank you, Keita, for the introduction, and thank you for having us here today. Um, I'm Takeshi Uemura. I work, as, a, as she said, I work as a geriatrician and practical care physician in nursing homes and hospitals in Honolulu, Hawaii. Today, I'm going to talk about symptom management of COVID-19 in nursing home settings. Today's talk was made in collaboration with Dr. Eric Chen. Dr. Chen is a good friend of mine. He's a geriatrician working in nursing homes in Yakima, Washington State. His nursing homes were hit hard by COVID. Since none of the nursing homes in Hawaii have experienced the spread of COVID-19, today's talk is based on literature review, recommendations from professional organizations, and Dr. Chen's experience. There are so many unknowns with COVID-19, and there are almost no definitive answers to symptom management of COVID-19 in nursing home settings. I welcome any suggestions from the audience. I hope we can have an active discussion after uh, my presentation involving Dr. Chen. Please feel uh, free to ask questions um, later um, after this presentation. Okay, next slide. So why is symptom management important for COVID-19 patients? COVID-19 can cause severe symptoms, especially dyspnea, and yet there is no virus-specific treatment. That means supportive approach, including symptom management, will be the main treatment of the disease. Also in nursing home settings, some patient goes of care only requires comfort measures, measures, and also they may not want to be transferred to a hospital. That means those who work in nursing homes need to know how to manage symptoms, especially given that most of the nursing homes do not have the capabilities to consult a specialist palliative care patient. And also, um, as I will be presenting in a minute, most of the patients with COVID-19 will have only mild symptoms. That means you may not be able to refer to hospice 
if the patient only has mild symptom, even though COVID-19 can be a deadly disease later in the course. Again, this means you may need to know how to manage symptoms without help from hospice agencies. Next slide. So what kind of symptom can COVID-19 cause? Three major symptoms are fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Less commonly, COVID-19 can cause chills, sore throat, muscle pain, chest pain, new uh, loss of taste or smell, nausea, and diarrhea. Next. COVID-19 is very different from other typical respiratory infections that we usually see in nursing homes. In order to provide sufficient symptom management of COVID-19, it is important to understand its clinical course. So I am going to talk about the clinical course for the next couple of slides. This slide show you a time course of symptom onset of COVID-19 based on a report from Wuhan, China. They reviewed 191 hospitalized patients and found that patients developed cough and fever first, and then around day seven, patients developed dyspnea. And a couple of, the, a couple of days later, they were diagnosed with acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. When the patient developed ARDS, they required mechanical ventilator support, after which many of the patients died within a couple of days. Just know that this data is from younger population who were admitted to hospital and treated aggressively. Therefore, COVID-19 patient in nursing homes who remain in the facility would die much quicker since there is no ICU level care and high oxygen support. The bottom line here is that there is a pattern with the time course of symptom onset with COVID-19. Next. These are the CAT scan of the lung of a COVID-19 patient who developed ARDS. ARDS is a widespread inflammatory process in the lungs that leads to the blockage of air, air space with fluid which is shown as whitish material on the CAT scan. This obstruction can cause severe hypoxia that leads to the death quickly unless there is a ventilatory support. ARDS from bacterial pneumonia usually develops over a couple of days. I heard from pulmonologists who treat COVID-19, ARDS due to COVID-19 develops much quicker than the bacterial pneumonia one and usually within hours. So this is very different from what we usually see in bacterial pneumonia. Next. As I said, the report from Wuhan, China about symptom onset was based on hospitalized younger patient population. Then what about nursing home residents? This slide shows you three different types of clinical course of COVID-19 in nursing home patients. This idea of classification was described by Dr. Jim Wright, who works in a nursing home in Virginia. His facility has been hit by a surge of COVID-19, and he summarized his experience. His uh, experience report is available in on the homepage. This description matches with Dr. Chin's experience as well. The first type was named by him as the indolent course deadly. The patient in this course has a fever and respiratory symptom in the first 24 hours, then becomes stable for three to five days and acutely becomes very ill and dies within 24 hours. Next type is named as acute respiratory failure. And the patient in this course develops symptoms for the fever and acute respiratory failure and die very rapidly. According to him, within only six to 12 hours since the start of the symptom. The last course is named indolent course convalescence, and actually a majority of patients follow this course. In this course, patients have mild symptoms, including fever and cough, and maybe shortness of breath, and they usually recover after seven to 10 days. Next slide. I want to quickly mention about asymptomatic patients in the nursing home, because I know many of you have heard asymptomatic patient, even though they are positive for COVID-19. In this study, they did a 
facility white point prevalence survey for COVID-19 when they found that a couple of residents tested positive for COVID-19 in the facility. They did a test on 76 residents and 48 of them turned out to be positive for COVID-19. And surprisingly, 56% of them were asymptomatic at the time of testing. However, a majority of asymptomatic patients subsequently became asymptomatic, usually after four days. That means even though we know some patients can be positive for COVID-19 and not have symptoms, eventually a majority of them become symptomatic in the nursing home setting. Next slide. This slide shows you a cohort study of nursing home residents from Kings County, Washington where COVID-19 hit nursing homes hard. In this nursing home, 101 residents got COVID-19 and 54% of them required hospitalization and 33% of the 101 patient died. So even though we know that COVID-19 can be a deadly disease in nursing home residents who have multiple comorbidity and are very frail, still about 65% of them survive COVID-19. That means if a frail nursing home resident get COVID, we should not assume that they will certainly die. Actually, many of them will only have mild symptoms. Next slide. So what does this mean for us? Firstly, I think it is important to recognize that it is very difficult to predict which patient will become very ill and which patient will only have mild symptoms, even though we know chronic conditions and older age can increase the risk of serious condition. Many patients actually recover from COVID-19. If they develop respiratory failure, it typically happens on day seven, plus or minus three days. Then once they develop serious respiratory failure, they will die with the, without aggressive treatments. And this happens very quickly in a range of hours. That means the onset of symptom to death is only a week or so. And as you all know, COVID-19 is highly contagious and it can easily spread in nursing home settings and can cause many clusters of cases in, of COVID-19. Next slide. That means it is crucial to clarify the goals of care in advance, at least before they develop respiratory failure on day seven. Then you have to be prepared to manage the rapid development of severe dyspnea. In order to respond to this rapid onset of severe dyspnea, you may want to consider to prescribe comfort kit, including morphine or other opioids and lolazepam early. I will talk about this later as well. Since patients develop respiratory failure around day seven, if there are many COVID-19 patients in the facility, it can create a surge of patients with severe dyspnea. That means the facility staff can be overwhelmed with the surge, and it is important to think about how you can secure human resource in case of a surge. Also, the family needs to be informed about the possibility of rapid decline so that they won't be shocked. And also, I want to point out that figuring out when to refer a patient to a hospice might be challenging given the rapid change of the patient condition. Since COVID-19 is highly contagious, you may want to be creative in order to reduce physical contact with patients. Consider video monitoring even though it may be difficult to implement in terms of privacy protection in nursing home settings. And also around the clock administration of medications and prescribing long acting opioids early. We'll talk about this later in detail as well. Next slide. Given that COVID-19 can have a high mortality rate and severe symptom burden, it may be natural to think about hospice referrals but the situation is not that simple. Since many of COVID-19 patients recover even in the nursing home population, COVID-19 itself is not, cause, uh, is not used as a terminal diagnosis unless it causes respiratory failure and imminent death. 
Therefore, when we consider hospice referral for COVID-19, there will be two scenarios. One is that the patient has terminal condition that already qualified the patient for hospice, but the hospice, uh, sorry, the patient has not been referred yet. Then the patient got COVID-19 and that exo convinced them to be referred to hospice. The other scenario is a COVID-19 patient who develops severe respiratory failure and will most likely die. However, a nursing home patient with severe respiratory failure usually die rapidly. Therefore, there may not be enough time to make a referral. Some hospice agency may not accept even COVID-19 patient. It is important to think about the balance between the benefits and risks of patient uh, hospice referrals. The benefits are that you can have the hospice provider support when you have questions about symptom management. And the hospice can help to provide support to families who may not be able to visit patients. Also, hospice can provide bereavement support as well. The downside of hospice referral is that hospice staff can spread infection and they also can use a facilities uh, supply of PPE. Therefore, it is important to discuss with hospice agencies and then figure out which side of the staff, facility or hospice, will provide what kind of care to patients to prevent the duplication. Lastly, visitor restrictions can complicate the process of hospice enrollment. So the bottom line here is that you may not have hospice support when you are dealing with COVID-19 patients in nursing homes. Next slide. If you do not have advanced care planning before a patient gets COVID-19, you should do it as soon as you find out the patient has COVID-19. Make sure you know who will be the decision maker if the patient becomes seriously ill. And you need to explore what matters most to the patient. If the goal is clear to provide comfort measure, you focus on managing symptoms. Since the COVID-19 patient can code, uh, sorry, since the COVID-19 can cause severe respiratory failure and death, it is important to clarify if they want to be transferred to hospital if they become seriously sick. Also, obviously, address code status is important. Next. Since you need to use opioid to manage symptom, I want to give you a brief review of the opioids. First, it is important to know the pharmacodynamics of opioids meaning how quickly it works and how long it lasts. Typically, patients will have peak effect from PO opioid, oral opioid, 30 to 6 minutes after they took opioid. And this effect I am talking about is not only for pain, but also dyspnea. Therefore, if you want to, if you wait more than one hour after patient took a, a needed opioid, patient would not get additional effect. That means if patient is symptomatic after one hour, you should do something else. Do not wait more than one hour. IV is quicker. You should not wait more than 15 minutes before taking additional action to control symptom if it's not controlled enough. Duration of action for opioid are usually three to four hours. However, if patient has renal failure or liver failure, this can become longer, usually six to eight hours. So if you schedule morphine, you give morphine every four hours unless the patient has renal impairment. In nursing home residents, actually many of them have renal impairment and typically require dosage every six hours. Next slide. If you need to use opioid, morphine is always the first choice. Since it is cheap, effective, available in various forms, and most clinical studies were done using morphine. However, morphine is not recommended for severe renal impairment, which is here defined as creatinine clearance less than 30. You have to notice that I'm not talking about creatinine value. You have to calculate creatinine clearance since you have to incorporate not only creatinine value, but also age, weight, sex, in order to estimate their renal function. If patient is clearly dying and only has hours to a few hours, some hospice providers actually use morphine. 
even though the patient has a uh, renal impairment because the toxic metabolite would not accumulate before the patient dies. If patient has renal impairment, the safest opioids are fentanyl and methadone, and then hydromorphone and oxycodone are the safer choice. Next. Okay, now I'm going to talk about its specific symptom. I will cover dyspnea, cough, excess secretion, acute pain, deridium, nausea, diarrhea, and fever. Okay, here we go. Next. First, dyspnea. Dyspnea is a subject of feeding. Therefore, do not rely on SpO2. You may see a patient who has normal SpO2, but still has this significant dyspnea. Dyspnea can be described as breathlessness, inability to take a deep breath, air hunger, or chest tightness. The patient may engage in pursed breathing and also may express anxiety, fear, or panic. Next. Since we are talking about nursing home setting, I want to mention about the challenges of dyspnea assessment on dementia patient. If patient has significant dementia, always ask about their current state only meaning you ask them if they have symptoms right now. You do not want to ask them about the past, meaning how long have you had this or since when? What about last night? If the patient doesn't remember those things, they may provide false information. So just focus on the current state. Then you may want to use different terms to describe dyspnea, like choking, tightness, etc since they may not understand some certain terms. Then give them time to respond. Dementia is slow down language processing and I understand you are all, we are all busy, but do not rush them to get the answer. Then you should pay attention to nonverbal clues, including grimacing, frowning, inability, irritability, how quickly they are breathing, and SpO2. If they have dementia, they may not call for you even though they have dyspnea. So it is important to proactively check in on the patient. Next slide. Same for assessing dyspnea on patients who are somnolent on comatose. Severe medical condition can make a patient somnolent, but that does not mean that the, they do not feel dyspnea assume that they still suffer from dyspnea. Since they cannot speak, you have to pay close attention to their facial expression if their breathing is labored, respiratory rate, and SpO2. Next slide. So how do you treat dyspnea? First, you do non-pharmacological approach, meaning put the patient upright and then start O2 if SpO2 is below 90%. Just as a tip, there is no additional benefit of increasing O2 flow about five liter if patient is only using nasal cannula. Also in COVID-19 patient, high flow nasal cannula or BiPAP are not recommended since they can create aerosols and increase the risk of in infection spread. If you notice wheezing or ronchi, the patient may have bronchospasm. In that occasion, an arbitral inhaler may help to expand the bronchi. It is important not to use nebulizer treatment since it can create uh, aerosol. Nursing home residents may not be able to use an inhaler correctly, and that can be a challenge. Also, you can consider using steroid if you think that patient has bronchospasm. I know there is some concern of immunosuppression by giving steroid, but there is no conclusive evidence on whether or not steroids are bad in COVID-19 patients. So if the goal is comfort, I think it is worth a try. Next slide. Then if the patient is still dysnic, you should use opioid. Any kind of opioid will work for dyspnea and use as needed PRN first. After finding the right dose, I recommend to keep the dose around the clock since the patient may not request PRN. And therefore, without around the clock dosing, dyspnea can be undertreated. For opioid night patient, five to 10 milligrams of morphine is the initial dose for uh, oral morphine. 
Next slide. This diagram shows you the flow of this new management recommended in the pocket card from Stanford. It is available in CAPSI website. Treat the underlying disease and start O2, then start opioid. If the patient is actively dying or requires comfort measures only, here they recommend to use opioid aggressively since the symptom can be very severe. If the patient has severe dyspnea, opioid, uh, IV opioids are preferred over PO since it can work quickly and you can titrate up the dose quickly and also use continuous infusion. Obviously, this recommendation is made for a hospital-based practice. And I understand that IV or sub Q are not always available in nursing homes. And also, I understand some people feel nervous about using opioid for dyspnea due to the risk of side effects and toxicity. However, that, that is why you have to have a clear picture of what patient's goals are. If the goal is comfort, what is the point of being worried about causing side effects or toxicity? Your job is to make the patient comfortable. In the palliative care world, this is referred as a double effect. I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but again, do not uh, be afraid to use opioid. Then again, if you feel simple, if you feel the symptoms are overwhelming, consider to call a particular specialist if they're available. Next. In order to reduce the exposure to the virus, some particular care experts start long acting opioids early. This is not a typical practice since it may cause overdose, but with COVID-19, it may make sense since the patient can die rapidly. Obviously, careful assessment of prognosis, goals of care, risk of exposure, and PP availability are crucial. Fentanyl patches are not usually recommended for opioid naive patients in ordinary situation. However, with COVID-19, this may be a good option since it releases uh, opioid over 72 hours. You have to know that the fentanyl patch still takes at least 12 hours to reach the full effect, and therefore you should still use a uh, short-acting opioid for several hours to control the symptom before the fentanyl patch takes effect. The next option will be to start sub or IV opioid infusion at a low rate so that you won't have to go into the room every four hours to give bolus. Also, if you have PCA palm that has long tubing, you may be able to press the button and then give PRN dose from the outside of the room. Again, these are the suggestions based on private care providers practice in other states. Next slide. I will quickly overview medications for cough. Codeine and then dextromethorphan both work for cough by suppressing the cough reflex. Also, all other opioids like morphine, oxycodone, works as cough suppressants. It is unclear if there is an additional benefit of adding codeine if the patient is already on an opioid. And also, nets are not recommended because it can create aerosol. However, you can try an arbitral inhaler to treat the cough. Next slide. Treatment for excess secretion is shown on this slide. You can read it later uh, in detail, but gofenacin works by uh, stimulating the cough reflex and simulate the airway secretion so the patient can cough up mucus. On the other hand, you can use anticholinergics such as scopolamine or glycopyrrolate to dry up the secretion. However, you have to watch for side effects of anticholinergics, including dry mouth, urinary retention, etc. Also, scopolamine can cause delirium, especially in nursing home residents, but glyco does not pass the blood brain barrier, and therefore, glyco sh should not cause delirium. Therefore, glyco is usually recommended for geriatric population. Since suctioning can create aerosol, suctioning is generally, generally not recommended for COVID 19 patients. Deep suctioning is undoubtedly uncomfortable anyway. 
If the patient has the increased secretion in imminent death phase, they are called terminal secretions, and we believe it is not burdening the patient anymore. Therefore, it is more important to educate the family that this is not causing any suffering since the family can be anxious by hearing the gargling sounds from the patient's throat. Next slide. I will quickly go over acute pain management. Pain assessment can be challenging in nursing home patients due to cognitive decline. If the patient is severely demented, consider using skills such as pain ed, which I will explain to you in the next slide. Again, do not ask about the past or time course of the pain. Just focus on the current state is the key when you're assessing the pain in demented patients. The same as for dyspnea, even if the patient is somnolent due to severe condition, you should assume that patient is still feels pain. Since the patient won't be able to tell you if they're in pain, you should gauge your pain, their pain based on their facial expression, body posture, restlessness. If you suspect pain, you should try pain medication to see if those manifestations will subside. If you suspect acute pain in COVID-19 patient, you can use acetaminophen first. The max dose is three gram per day in geriatric population. I usually use one gram uh, three times a day. And things are not recommended for COVID-19 patients since there is a concern that it, can, it may increase the risk of severe condition. Then if patient still has pain, you can use uh, opioid as needed. Next slide. Next slide. Yes. Um, pain ed, it, I, well, yes. Um, pain ed is a use, useful scale for assessing pain in nonverbal patient with dementia. It assesses five domains breathing, negative vocalization, facial expression, body language, and consultability. Sensitivity is 92% and specificity is 61%. That means the patient, patient score high even though the patient does not have pain. Therefore, it is more useful if you use this as a pre and post treatment to see if the pain medication brings down the score. Next slide. Severe dyspnea and other severe conditions can easily cause deradium in nursing home residents. First, as always, do a full exam and look for any untreated pain, urinary retention, and correct them if you find any. Also, you may want to make sure that the environment is safe since these confused patients are at high risk for falls. Then do not do non-pharmacological approach, which include optimizing the environment and medication, reviewing medication, and eliminating any tethers. Pain is the, pain is the leading cause of the reading. You may want to try acetaminophen or dose of an opioid to see if this comes down, come the, come the patient down. Then you can give Haldol and then Lorazepam. I know Lorazepam can worsen the iridium in geriatric teachings. However, especially in terminal iridium, benzos uh, typically works better. Next slide. As you have seen, the medication you will need for symptom management are morphine, haldol, lorazepam, and glycol. Since the development of symptoms can happen very rapidly in COVID-19, it makes sense to prescribe these medication, which you usually prescribe for hospice patients, even before a hospice referral. Meaning when the patient has only mild symptoms, you should consider prescribing these me medications or make sure that you have these medication in stock in the facility. Next slide. Some COVID-19 patients, according to Dr. Chin's experience, about 10% uh, of them develop GI symptoms, which are nausea and diarrhea. You can use metoclopramide or ondansetron to treat nausea. Also, if the patient experienced nausea from opioid, you can pre-medicate with either of them 30 minutes prior to the opioid. For diarrhea, you can use lo uh, loperamide as needed. Next slide. 
For fever, you can use acetaminophen. If patient keeps having fever, you may want to consider uh, giving it around the clock. Opioid causes constipation. For opioid-induced constipation, Senna is the first-line laxative. Next slide. I want to quickly touch on communicating with family. Since the family cannot visit patient, it can cause the family severe anxiety. Also, some may feel guilty and sad without being able to be by their side when their loved ones are sick. Make sure you have a system to provide regularly scheduled calls to family. And it is important to expect emotions and re to respond to it by using empathetic statement by using nurse, which is shown on this slide. Since there is a possibility of rapid decline, you should tell the family what to expect. IVP approach to family is important to provide comprehensive care. Since processing a dead body infected with COVID-19 will require special procedures, you may want to make sure which mortuary can handle this situation. Next slide. Frank Love prescribed uh, provide guidance how you can help the family to say goodbye via phone or video. This was developed by Fiverr Talk. You can read the script later. But the key here is to engage the family to say five things to their loved ones. Ira Bayak, which is a renowned public physician, wrote a book titled Four Things That Matters Most. There she says, please forgive me. I forgive you, I love you, and thank you are important to say in the last moment. And adding goodbye to uh, these four things is now known as five things to say. So you want to suggest them to say any of these five things over the phone or video. Next slide. And then you validate what they want to say and expect emotions and respond to it. Next slide. Okay, so take home message, acknowledge the ascendant uncertainty of the clinical course of COVID-19 and prepare for a possible rapid decline. Confirm the goals of care and uh, provide aggressive symptom management if the goal is comfort. Use opioids for refractory, refractory dyspnea and consider prescribing a comfort kit early on. And communication with family is crucial. Next slide. These are the resources you can find information about symptom management of COVID-19. And next slide. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Thank you. Thank you. Judy Thomas, CEO of the Coalition for Compassionate Care. And thank you, Dr. Mara, for that very informative presentation, you covered so much, so many helpful tips in there. Um, I'm just going to remind people to go ahead and put questions in the Q&A box. Um, so we have a couple here. Uh, one is, a first question is, you mentioned using opioids to reduce exposure. Could you explain that further? Sure. Um, I mean, so the uh, op long-acting opioid, which is fentanyl usually, um, so that you don't have to give the patient um, like as needed often or schedule morphine, which is usually every four hours to six hours. So I had uh, some part of care providers in mainland uh, use, use fentanyl patch to reduce the, you know, to, to reduce this frequent visit by staff so that it can, we, you know, decrease the exposure to the virus. That's what I mean. Thank you. Um, and a reminder that the um, slides and the recording will be sent out to all attendees later. Um, and if you missed this, you'll still be, if you missed it live, you can still listen to it recorded. Um, we have a thank you, thank you for responding to that question. 
and thank you for an excellent presentation. Again, if you have any questions, put them into the Q&A box. So we'll just give people a little bit more time here um, to come up with some questions. I think you did such a good thorough job. Thank you. Um, <laughs> topics. So, Maybe. Um, yeah, Do you, if there's no question, I think I want to have, uh, I want to give opportunity to speak to uh, Dr. Eric Chen because I think he has, you know, many experience in dealing with COVID-19 patients. And that I think uh, he shared a story how um, he can, he's hungering the, you know, family to say goodbye uh, to patient, like a visiting at the last moment. So Eric, Dr. Chen, if you can share that story. Yes, uh, this is Dr. Chen here. Um, sorry, Takashi, I don't quite understand the question. Are you talking about visitation rules for uh, nursing homes or what are you yeah, then, referring to? Yeah, when they are dying, I think you mentioned that, you know, how you are allowing the patient, uh, sorry, family to visit the patient and then say goodbye. Uh, oh, yeah. While still, you know, maintaining the, you know, distancing yeah. and, the, you know, infection control. Yeah. So, Right now, the CMS has no visitation rules uh, to the nursing facilities unless it's end of life situation. And the best marker that I use to gauge when, when, uh, when that moment will be, when will I consider a patient's end of life, is uh, re, you know looking at their oxygen saturation is definitely a one indicator. If they if they descend down to 90s on room air. And that tells me that they're in a critical situation. Um, and that's when I start to consider uh, that family should come in and visit. Along with that, you can also look at the amount that they're eating and the amount that they're drinking. Um, if they have less than four cups of water or fluids a day, that's also telling you that they're uh, moving on to the next stage. Next stage, they're probably dehydrated now and the uh, prognosis for them is probably hours to days at this point and that's when family should really be invited to come in yeah and then i think you set up you know how you maintain the distance you know and then the, give them ppe and stuff like that it's it's different at every facility um the the majority of the facilities that, that I, I give them advice to, I tell them that make sure that you have enough space to maintain the six feet distance when the family come in. And that's, on, that's, on a, that's not only between uh, the patient and the family, also the family and the staff members who work in the building. So most of the buildings don't have a group of family come in. Um, they must segregate they segregate, segregate the visit time. So they have, for example, they have three visitors, that rules like having three visitors a day, uh, one visitor at a time and one hour at a time to, uh, to, uh, to, to reinforce the uh, social distancing. Some family members are scared to come in as well and some of them choose to have virtual visits with their loved ones. Uh, so some facilities help set them, set them up um, by Zoom meetings or Skype or FaceTime. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure if any of our nursing facilities in California are letting visitors in yet, but when we do start to do that, that would be very helpful to keep in mind. Um, we did have a shout out to our nursing facilities acknowledging the challenge that they have in this current situation. Um, and that the, the staff working in facilities are heroes. And please feel free to share the link of the recording and this information with the nursing homes you work with. We have a question in the facility data, um, the McMichael study. Um, do they disaggregate or carve out those who already had a DNR status? And would this make a difference in the data that even if someone had a DNR, they were allowed to die? Um, they might have survived if they've been treated aggressively. 
I can answer to that question if you, is that okay, Tagashi? Sure, yes, please. Sure. So the, the, the study that's uh, Takashi recorded has a mortality rate of 33%. Uh, from my own experience working in Yakima, and we're talking about a rural setting, um, none of our nursing home has any ventilators. We don't give IV routinely, and our local hospital only has 10 ventilators. Um, our mortality rate is at around 20 to 30%, and majority, most 90% of our patients chose comfort oriented care. I would say less than 10% of our patients um, chose to be hospitalized. And that's out of uh, 300 cases right now. We still, we're still looking at 70 to 80% of people that recovered, even though we're only doing comfort oriented care. I have plenty of people that I started them on morphine and lorazepam for symptom management. And, you know, of course, the majority of the patients um, passes um, when you're when you're arrived at that stage. But we're still seeing about a small number of patients that actually survived it. Um, uh, of course, um, when you recover from the virus, um, we're talking about the respiratory symptoms. When the respiratory symptoms resolved. Uh, you could still be dealing with delirium, and that could persist for a long time as well. Uh, and some of the patients pass from delirium because they just don't have the intrinsic drive. Um, given that they already have the baseline of advanced dementia, they they don't they lost their intrinsic drive to feed themselves, and a lot of them pass away because of dehydration. And all of our patients are fed and cleaned by our care aides. And we do all we can to encourage them and to give them, to give their body the tools they need to overcome the disease. Um, confirming their goals to be DMR and comfort in the care, does that mean that we don't provide any treatment? Our treatment is comfort in the base comfort-based, meaning morphine or lorazepam, instead of sending them to the hospital for high flows or BiPAP. And sometimes patients will still survive, um, even with just comfort-oriented treatments. Any questions? We have, yes, we do have some more questions. Um, here's one for patient with full code status. So they do want full code, resuscitation attempted. Is resuscitation used for the COVID-19 patients when they go into respiratory distress? From our hospital experience, um, it really depends on the, the capacity of your hospital and your uh, own local outbreak situation at the time. Um, if they are if they are full code by default, you need to resuscitate them, you need to intubate them. However, there are given different circumstances, different given different circumstances, for example, like New York City, the EMS would no longer bring any patients to the hospital if they were found unresponsive or without a pulse for more than five minutes of the scene. Um, um, they will not resuscitate these patients. Um, this this question really depends on the local availability, availability of ventilators, and it's going to be an ongoing discussion. Um, if patients has progressed to the point that they would need ventilators, um, very few of them will survive, um, and will be, and very few of them, very few, very few of them will be successful, successfully weaned off the ventilators. So there's going to be a continuous goals of care discussion as the situation develops, and there's no one uh, fixed answer. Yeah, and then uh, I believe there's a uh, guideline or recommendation from ABDA how to do uh, CPR in nursing home setting for COVID-19 patients. And as far as 
I remember, I think you had to put the plastic seats or something to cover a patient's uh, face in order to uh, prevent uh, in, like aerosol spread of you know, the virus. But obviously it's not, you know, it's very risky procedure. And then, yeah, I think it's better to uh, consider it to make patient DNR and after clarifying goals, if it matches with the goal. Great, thank you. Yes, uh, we always want to respect patients' wishes. Um, and if someone really, really wants to be DNR, take those precautions before performing that. Um, we have another question. So do you have any thoughts about allowing visits um, from family when a resident's at end of life by phone? Any suggestions on how to make that work? Eric, can you answer? Sure. Um, when patients are end of life, um, we're looking, we're looking, we're really looking at a patient who um, is suffering from acute respiratory failure, um, probably has ultra mental status. Uh, the mental status is probably down to NO times zero, maybe NO times one if you're lucky. So in this circumstances, um, phone conversation is probably not an effective way to communicate. Um, patients may not be may not be able to answer the phone at this stage. Um, if if you're talking about um, conversations prior to being end of uh, end of life, prior to being prognosis of hours to days, um, facilities are definitely encouraged to um, establish communication. Uh, between families and their uh, and the residents in the nursing home and this communication can happen by a, a wide variety of means telephone uh, virtual visits by, tab uh, by, by tablets or even a visit at the window side so we don't want to wait until things has progressed to the point that it's end of life with prognosis of hours to days because then the patient is not able to communicate with family. And I assume as there's an outbreak in the building, um, there should be, um, there should be already, uh, you should be already at the planning stage on how you can uh, maintain the conversation and not wait until the last minute or last moment. Very good advice. Um, we have a question. Um, do you have any advice on talking with families about opioids and concerns about morphine or you know some of the strong opioid medications? I'll defer this question to uh, Takashi. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, as a I, I work in the hospice as well, so I, I get this kind of question all the time. Uh, first, I I think uh, I would uh, explore what the concerns are. And then always important to acknowledge the emotion. So I, I hear you and then I understand it's concerning. And then acknowledge emotion after that, I, I explain. You know, usually they, they're concerned of like addiction or, you know, um, stuff like that. But actually there's, I mean, if the patient is actually dying and then we are talking about like hours to days, there's no point obviously to uh, worry about addiction. Um, and then I think we have to, so I think, you know, the, as a provider, I understand it, it can be also concerning to the provider to give morphine for uh, dyspnea because we know that it can cause respiratory suppression. But so that's why I, I said in the slide, uh, I think it's important to clarify the goals and then make sure that the goal is comfort. I mean, if the goal is comfort, uh, we provide aggressive care because I mean, we don't want to leave the patient suffering. So, um, yeah, that's that's my advice. Great, thank you. And getting lots more. Thank you, thank you for this presentation. Um, a note from one of our attendees that even if patients, um, residents are unresponsive, they can still hear. So, um, holding up the phone so they could hear a loved one's voice can be helpful. Um, yes. We have a couple of questions about, you know, what are you seeing with trends? And um, one is this idea of a strike team, where um, this is happening in some communities in California, 
where um, a palliative care team from outside the facility, from the health system, is made available to go into the nursing facility and help support um, the nursing facility staff if there's a COVID outbreak. So are you seeing that, these kind of outside teams helping? Also another question about are you seeing quarantine wards for active COVID residents in nursing homes? Um, so I can tell you about the Hawaii situation. So the, the, the COVID-19 spread is very mild in Hawaii, luckily. Uh, but we, we don't know what's going to happen in the second wave. So we're preparing for the uh, possible second wave. Um, and then we are in active discussion about uh, creating a palliative care hotline so that any provider in nursing home and home setting or wherever can have access to uh, specialist palliative care. But we don't have many palliative care in uh, Hawaii, unfortunately. So I'm I'm glad I, I'm impressed that you know that California is creating such system to get the palliative care supports. So I think it's great. And what was the second question? I'm sorry. The quarantine unit. A quarantine unit. Yeah. So um, we are considering to create a ded dedicated a facility to manage COVID-19 patients. So if you, if we find a patient in the facility to have COVID-19, we're planning to transfer to that dedicated facility so that we can congregate the COVID-19 patients and then focus on uh, symptom management. So that's in, in the process of planning. So, Eric, Dr. Chin, do you have any comments? Um, actually, CDC has a specific um, long-term care guideline on what to do in situation when you're short-staffed. I guess that's why you're asking. Um, so they they, um, they prioritize, they ask us to first consider transfer the patient out if you're short-staffed, um, transfer them to a safer place. And if that's not possible, then you're, you're allowed to use the staff that has COVID-19 but minimal symptoms come back into work um, and they should prioritize working with COVID-19 patients, then recover patients. And at certain times they can even work with the COVID negative patients. Um, this, uh, this situation is going to be very fluid and diff very different in each uh, health district. So my advice is to check in with CDC guidelines and to um, to be in touch with your local health district and they will be the ones that's helping you and coordinating um, and mitigating a staffing shortage. Um, in terms of uh, strike team, um, the local experience that we have is, is the uh, state health department sending in their medical epidemiologist come in to look at each building um, to look at their infection control practices and give recommendations and help with screening. And that's the strike team experience that we have. And that's all I have to share. Great, thank you very much. Um, we did have a couple questions we won't be able to get to today, but we will um, share them with our speakers and ask them to follow up with those people who ask those questions. So again, I want to I wish we could give you a big round of applause. Um, I think our attendees found this extremely helpful and we really appreciate you sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us today. So this is the end of our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye.